Beverly Oliver, the former nightclub singer at the Colony Club, believes she saw the man who killed the president. She was in Dealey Plaza on the morning of the assassination. She carried with her a brand new movie camera to film the president as he passed by. For many years she remained unidentified and because of her distinctive headscarf was known simply as the Babushka Lady. I had President Kennedy right in my Zoom lens. You know, I could see Conley anytime. He's a Texan, right? Appreciate him, love him, he's great, but I wanted to see the president. In the carnival atmosphere surrounding the motorcade, there was no indication of the danger lurking seconds away in Dealey Plaza. When I first uh, heard a noise, I was not aware that that was a shot being fired. And maybe perhaps that's why I continued to film, because I thought it was a backfire or a, a firecracker. I mean, I wasn't used to being around guns. I, I did not realize that those were shots until I saw in my fr the frame of my camera President Kennedy's head come off the back of his head then I realized that that was a shot uh, I don't know how many I heard I know spe where I thought the shots came from I was uh, the picket fence area in that around that large tree somewhere on the other side of those steps but in the picket fence area there was a figure there and there was smoke there I will always believe that the man that shot President Kennedy was standing somewhere in the picket fence area and no one will ever convince me any differently. Next to Beverly, as she filmed, was eyewitness Charles Brem with his young son. He was swiftly besieged by newsmen. Tell us exactly what you saw, sir. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> he was coming down the street, and my five-year-old boy and myself were by ourselves on the grass there on Palmer Street, and I asked Joe to wave to him, and Joe waved, and I waved, and the man... The man... That's all right, sir. You were in it was frightening. They took me and my five-year-old boy um, because we were surrounded by the two busloads of people there. They had asked me, uh, how do you know it was rifle shots? Were you ever in the Army? Were you ever? I said, yes, I was, I was not only in the Army, I was in combat. And I pulled up my sleeve and showed them my arm and said that I've had uh, bullet holes in me. I'm, uh, so this started the, uh, the crowd around me. Well, some of the police thought that the, I was possibly the guilty party, and they took me right to the front door of the school book depository where a police car was parked and put me and little Joe in the, in the police car. Uh, well, an awful lot of the people who were uh, passing by there thought that I had did it, and I was uh, pounding on the car and, and calling me names that uh, you don't repeat in good company. Uh, and there were an awful lot of you didn't know the cops from the robbers. After the assassination, Beverly was contacted at work by FBI agents who took her undeveloped film and promised to return it within 10 days. She has not seen it since. From the position that I was filming, I had the best shot of the assassination and probably the only one that had a real good shot of the grassy knoll. And... Uh, probably would be a lot of unanswered questions answered if my film could be found. Fortunately, a few feet to Beverly's left, Mary Ann Mormon in the dark coat took her picture a split second after the president had been fatally struck in the head. Although frequently examined by the FBI, her historic snapshot was too widely publicized to disappear. We know that the president's car was in the its dramatic secret, however, has only recently been uncovered. After five years of intensive study of the Mormon picture by two researchers in Texas, Jack White and Gary Mack, there is at last convincing evidence of a gunman up on the grassy knoll. It's the guy that we call Badge Man, and it uh, appears to me that from our study of it, his waist is right at the top of the wooden fence. Gary Mack was the first to isolate the image now known as Badge Man. What I was looking at to a lot of people might have just been like looking at an ink blot or something and all of a sudden I started to see eyes and ears and forehead and hair and little by little the pieces of this uh, image started to make sense to me uh, and, and that's when I first called Jack and uh, with his photographic work doing the blow-ups we could see more and more and more detail and at one point we realized that this fellow was probably wearing a police uniform or some type of uniform that was close enough to what the Dallas police were wearing 
was um, so that he could pass as a police officer. And really, that to me, that was the one scary moment because that was such a brilliant plan. A police officer in that location, away from where people were watching, if anyone did see him, they wouldn't think anything about it because there were police in that area, although nowhere near where we see this guy. So this guy was an imposter. And I got chills then because that was the realization that this was a very cleverly well thought out plan. You have to keep in mind that the Mary Mormon picture is about this size and the area that we're dealing with is about a quarter inch square. So the area that Badge Man appears in is very tiny. And that's why the attempts to enhance it photographically have been very difficult uh, over the years. This small area was the scene of an extraordinary encounter. Behind the picket fence, there is a car park. And in 1963, Gordon Arnold was a 22-year-old serviceman, just out of training camp and en route to a posting in Alaska. This is his first film interview. On that particular morning, what happened was I came downtown and I thought there was going to be a parade. So what I did was I parked my vehicle back here in this parking lot. And I intentionally walked to this particular corner because I wanted to take a pictures of the parade off of the railroad bridge. Well, this is about as far as I got because what happened is when I got my leg to about this position, a man came around the corner off the bridge, had a suit on, and he turned around and he told me that I wasn't going to be there. And I guess I was younger and more spunky at that time because I told him, you and who else is going to keep me off the bridge? And he pulled out an identification card and he said, I'm with the CIA. And I said, well, that's enough muscle. I'll leave. So I turned around and I brought my leg back over like this. And I walked down the fence line here about halfway. And I was looking over the fence to see if I could get a good shot of the parade. And he came back up and he told me, he says, I told you to get out of this area. And I said, okay. So I walked the complete length of the fence, got around on the other side. That's when I started to line up my frame so that I could take the picture of the parade. I had been panning shots through here so that I could get whatever was gonna come down the street. And I saw that it was the President of the United States. And as I was panning down this direction, just as I got to about this position, a shot came right past my left ear. And that meant it would have had to have come from this direction. And that's when I fell down. And to me, it seemed like a second shot was at least fired over my head. It was, there's a bunch of report going on in, the, in this particular area at that time. And what happened was that while I was laying on the ground, it seemed like a gentleman came from this particular direction. And I thought it was a police officer because he had a uniform of a police officer. But he didn't wear a hat. And he had dirty hands. But it didn't really matter much at that time because with him crying like he was, and with him shaking when he had the weapon in his hand, I think I'd have gave him almost anything except the camera because that was my mother's. And literally what the man did was kick, kick me and asked me if I was taking a picture. I told him that I was. And when I looked at the weapon, it was about that big around, and I decided I'd let him go ahead and have the film. I gave it to him, and then he went back off in this direction. I went off in this direction. And three days later, I was in Alaska. And I didn't come back to the United States for about 18 months. We spent a lot of time studying uh, the picture and looking at little details and I guess in the back of our minds was a story that had come out four years earlier uh, by a man named Gordon Arnold who claimed to be a witness to the assassination and claimed to have been standing up by the fence and there was a light blob of something uh, very close to where Badge Man was and we weren't sure what it was but gradually as details started coming out with Jack's photo work we realized that this image was probably Gordon Arnold and here's a guy who's, who had told his story just to a, an acquaintance and was overheard, and that story went off to the news media, and uh, Gordon Arnold was interviewed, and it appeared in the newspaper uh, that he had been at the scene and was in that location, but no one believed him because there were no uh, photographs or films that showed a man in that position. But all of a sudden, the Mormon picture confirmed his story. And again, the interesting part is that Gordon Arnold's story came out four years before we noticed uh, the appearance of this figure 
in the Mormon photograph. We later learned that uh, Arnold was wearing uh, this army cap that had a slight uh, point at the top and a medallion on the right-hand side that said U.S. Army, and it's exactly what we see in the photograph. We also know that Gordon Arnold was filming this scene with a movie camera, and that's exactly what the photograph shows, because we see the right arm of the person in this position uh, with his hand up toward his face uh, and what appears to be obstructing his face, uh, something perhaps like a movie camera. All right, you want to check that measurement once again? Yeah, this is about... Gary and Jack's work has been verified and duplicated by independent experts in Great Britain. Measurements taken in Dealey Plaza and from Mary Ann's original camera confirm that it was possible for the Badgeman figure to have fired the fatal headshot. And excellent view of the street from here. See the center lane, which is where the president was. Uh, and see that whole lane for almost the entire period. It's a great position to be in. Yeah, from this position, but the photograph exactly had yet more to reveal. I was sitting in my office here one day, uh, looking at the picture, and I saw what, it, just all of a sudden, what appeared to be uh, another image standing directly behind uh, the badge man. Uh, this is a, appears to be a person in a hard hat and a white t-shirt. Uh, the lighting on him is entirely consistent with the lighting on badge man. Uh, in other words, there's a highlight on the uh, construction helmet that he seemed to be wearing. Uh, there's a shadow of his head down on his shoulders and the, the lighting source is absolutely consistent with the rest of the picture. Uh, he, he appears to be looking off in the direction of the uh, school book depository. It was important in all this work that we develop somehow some independent corroboration for what we were seeing. And one of the important and yet often neglected witnesses in the Kennedy case is a railroad signalman named Lee Bowers, who was working in a railroad tower behind the picket fence and behind the grassy knoll. And he had a good view of the area uh, where we see these figures. And he testified to the Warren Commission and told them that uh, when Kennedy appeared in Dealey Plaza, there were two men behind the fence that he could see. And these two men were uh, in this one position the whole time before, during, and after the shooting. Lee Bowers died in a mysterious car accident two and a half years after the assassination. However, his story is confirmed by another eyewitness, Ed Hoffman, a deaf mute who is interviewed here for the first time. I'd gotten off work early because I had a dentist appointment. I was traveling down the freeway here and I remembered that President Kennedy was coming to visit Dallas. I parked my car here. I realized at this spot that I would be able to see Kennedy pass close by. I stood here and waited, and I was looking towards where he would be coming from. I suddenly saw two men who looked suspicious directly over there in the car park. 25 years ago, these trees did not obscure the view. From his position at the side of the freeway, Ed Hoffman could clearly see the car park area behind the grassy knoll. I saw a man standing here, wearing a black hat and a blue jacket. I saw a puff of smoke and I thought it was a cigarette, but it wasn't. He had a gun and he walked towards the railroad. He tossed the gun to the second man. Then he turned and straightened his jacket, adjusted his hat and walked casually away. The man with the striped shirt, the railroad shirt, walked over to the electrical box with the gun. He took the gun apart. He put it in a toolbox. He then walked slowly away in the direction of the railroad track. When the motorcade passed by below me here, I realized that Kennedy had been shot. I was horrified. I saw a policeman standing on the railroad bridge and I tried to get his attention, but he didn't see me. So I got in my car and drove to the area where I had seen the two men. But there were so many people there and I couldn't find them. I went to the FBI to tell them what I had seen. They didn't want me to say anything. They offered me money to keep quiet. They didn't understand that it was more important for me to tell them what I'd seen. 
it was hard for me to communicate with them. I do feel that the two men I saw were working together and that the one with the gun behind the fence was the man who shot President Kennedy. Look at the situation. The FBI started in the investigation right away and they had all these reports, over 50 reports from eyewitnesses saying at least one of the shots came from that area. And here, all of a sudden, they've got a photograph that shows the precise area within a sixth of a second of when the president's head explodes. Someone, somewhere in the FBI, must have wondered, perhaps the gunman is in this picture. And I think they knew, the evening of the assassination, that there was a second gunman up in the grassy knoll. The medical evidence, as it exists now, does not indicate a shot from the front. But uh, we do have to understand that if Badge Man was firing, and if it was Badge Man's shot that struck the president in the head, that means the medical evidence has been altered. And there you've got conspiracy existing within the United States government. Despite the government, Gordon Arnold is certain of what he saw. The training that I had just finished, they were shooting live ammunition over us. And when a bullet goes past your ear and your eardrum feels like it's coming out the other side of your head, it's close. That's why I thought I was shot. There's no doubt in my mind that I was there. And it did occur. Further verification of Gordon's presence on the knoll comes from a surprising source, Senator Yarborough. During that shooting, my eye was attracted to the right. I saw a movement, and I saw a man just jump about 10 feet like at the old time flying tackle in football and land against a wall. I thought to myself, there's an infantryman who's either been shot at in combat or he's been trained thoroughly. The minute you hear firing, get under cover. This colorized version of the Badgeman picture was shown to Gordon Arnold for the first time. He has always believed there was no proof of his presence on the knoll that day. Looks like a soldier in, in summer uniform with an overseas cap on. It looks like it would have been my, my uniform. It looks like there's a... a camera. Or there's something up in front of the face. It looks like a, a, a white spot. If it's a flash, it would be like off of the a muzzle flash. This looks like a police officer because it, that would be the badge that would be the arm emblem. Would, would this fellow back here be the, uh, the railroad man I asked you about this morning? Because when I was walking to the site, and I, I had never told anybody that I had, when we were out there filming, it, it reminded me that the, there was a, uh, a railroad worker just standing out there by the railroad tracks. But that, it, it, it looks like somebody's taking a, a picture. Yeah, I, I couldn't figure out why, why would I be standing crooked until I flipped that up and if that's a muzzle blast or flash, then whoever's standing there would have been a fool to stand up straight. He'd been trying to get away from harm's way is what it boils down to. And that could very well be me. Son of a gun. That would be the closest thing that I've ever, to be honest with you, the picture bothers me because if, if this is uh, a true thing of what, what has occurred, then I could be the only one that... Saw the man. They killed the president. And to be honest with you, if I'd have known this, I wouldn't have given the any interview. That, that hits too close to home right now. 
If the figure is real, then that means the witnesses were correct and the researchers who have spoken of conspiracy for 25 years now were also correct. It means the Warren Commission was wrong. There was a conspiracy. The question then is who was involved in the conspiracy and alongside with that is was Lee Harvey Oswald involved in the conspiracy? Uh, one of the good things the Warren Commission did was literally itemize the last few days of Lee Harvey Oswald's life. And the problem for the Warren Commission now would become, well, he had no opportunity to be with other people to plan something like this. So we now have to wonder seriously, perhaps for the first time, whether Lee Harvey Oswald even fired any shots. The search for the men who did fire the shots has taken a dramatic step forward due to a painstaking and dangerous investigation by one man, writer Steve Ravel. My goal throughout the last four years has been to identify the people who actually murdered the President of the United States, build a case against them, and bring them into custody so that they can be questioned. Because it seems to me that the only way we are going to learn the true nature of this conspiracy and identify the people who were ultimately responsible is through them. Writer Steve Ravel's lone pursuit of Kennedy's killers began four years ago. His first breakthrough came when he was given the name of a French drug smuggler in prison in the United States, who, it was rumored, had some first-hand knowledge of the president's assassination. The initial turning point was the first meeting that I had with the French narcotics trafficker at Leavenworth Penitentiary. His name was Christian David. Uh, he had been a member of the old French Connection heroin network. Uh, he had then been a leader of the Corsican drug trafficking network in South America, known as the Latin Connection. And he had also been a, a, an intelligence agent for a number of intelligence services around the world. In exchange for my help in finding him an attorney to represent him against the possibility of his deportation to France after he finished his sentence at Leavenworth, he agreed to give me a certain amount of information concerning the assassination based upon his own knowledge. Uh, the first thing that he told me, uh, very reluctantly, and only after four or five hours of my arguing with him, was that he was aware that there had been a conspiracy to murder the president. And indeed, in uh, May or June of 1963 in Marseille, he had been offered the contract uh, to kill President Kennedy. That was the initial breakthrough, if you will. He was eventually deported to France. I remained in contact with him. I went to Paris to interview him in, in two prisons in Paris. And in the fear that he would be either um, committed to an asylum or that he would be convicted of an old murder charge, he gradually gave me additional information about the assassination. His position was that there were three killers and that they had been hired uh, on a contract which had been placed with the leader of the Corsican Mafia of Marseille, a man named Antoine Guérini. Guérini, he said, was asked to supply three assassins, high-quality, experienced killers, to, uh, to murder the president, and that Guérini did so. In the course of one of the first significant conversations I had with David on this subject, he told me that he had been in Marseille in May or June of 1963, uh, and that every evening he went to Antoine Guérini's club on the old port of Marseille to uh, meet people who owed him money. And one evening, uh, Guérini sent for him, asked him to come to his office, which was above the club. And Guérini told him that he had uh, an, an important contract, and he asked David if he were interested. David said, uh, who is the contract on? And Guérini said, an American politician. David asked, well, is it a congressman, a senator? And Guérini said, higher than that. La plus haute légume, he said, the highest vegetable. At that point, of course, David knew who he was talking about. David asked him where was the contract to be carried out. And when Guérini said it would be done inside the United States, David refused on the grounds that that was much too dangerous. Now, David initially would only give me the first name of one of the three men on the grounds that uh, two of the three were still alive. And since they were members of this Corsican milieu, which has a code of silence and a code of vendetta, if he named them, he, he himself would be murdered. However, he did agree to give me the first name of the, th of the third man who he said was dead. And that man, he said, was named Lucien. I then spent a great deal of time in Paris and Marseille trying to find out who this Lucien was. 
And through contacts that I made in the journalistic and police and intelligence communities, I was able to determine that this Lucien was in fact a Corsican drug trafficker and killer of the 1960s and 70s by the name of Lucien Sarti. Sarti had been killed in Mexico City in 1972. I confronted David with the name of Sarti, and he in effect confirmed that that was the man he had referred to. Uh, he was an extremely reckless, very daring man, known and despised even by his colleagues for taking enormous chances. But that same recklessness made him one of the most successful contract killers and uh, drug traffickers of his era. Having identified Sarti, Christian David, fearing for his life, refused to name the other two assassins recruited to kill Kennedy. Nonetheless, in successive interviews, he slowly began to reveal how the contract, placed here in Marseille, had been carried out. In the fall of 1963, the three killers were flown from Marseille to Mexico City, where they spent uh, some three or four weeks uh, at, a, uh, at the house of a contact in Mexico City. He said that they were then driven from Mexico City to the U.S. border at Brownsville, Texas. They crossed the border using Italian passports. He said that they were picked up on the American side of the border at Brownsville by a representative of the Chicago Mafia, with whom they conversed in Italian. They were then driven to Dallas and put up in a safe house which had been prepared for them so as not to leave any hotel records. He said that they spent uh, several days taking photographs of Dealey Plaza, and in the evenings at the safe house they studied the photographs and they arranged what he called a crossfire with three guns. On the question of the actual murder, he was reasonably specific that two of the assassins were in buildings behind the president's limousine. He did not know which buildings. However, he did specify that one was high and one was low. In fact, he said presque sur l'horizontal, almost on the horizontal. And he went on to add, uh, you can't understand the wounds unless you understand that one of the men was almost on the horizontal. Now, in a separate conversation with David, I asked him, based upon what I knew about Sarti's penchant for changing his appearance, whether Sarti had ever said anything to him about having worn a disguise. And David said, what do you mean by a disguise? I asked him, did Sarti ever indicate that he wore clothing other than he normally would have worn? And David thought about it for a moment and said, he wore a uniform. I asked him what kind of uniform and he refused to answer. But he did add that on jobs like this, they were always in disguise. He said if, for example, there were a military post nearby, they would dress in military uniforms. He said that there were four shots. The first shot was fired from the rear, struck the president in the back. The second shot was also fired from the rear and, as David said, hit the other man in the car. The third shot was fired by Sarti from the front, uh, struck the president in the head. And the fourth shot was fired from the rear and missed the automobile entirely. So his scenario, uh, as he claims to have learned it from the gunman, was three guns, four shots, three hits, one miss. He also added at one point that two of the shots were fired almost simultaneously. He said that uh, in the moment of panic, which always follows an incident of this kind, they were able to get away from Dealey Plaza and go back to the safe house. Now, he made the specific point that uh, the worst thing that you can do at a moment like that is to try to escape. And so they stayed in their safe house for some 10 days until things quieted down sufficiently and then they were flown by a private plane from uh, Dallas to Montreal. He said that the people who met them in Montreal were established contacts who were used to moving people in and out of the country and that from Montreal they returned to Marseille. Now, having told me all of this, um, I presented to him the obvious problem, which was his personal lack of credibility. And I asked him, was there anybody in the world who could substantiate this story? And it was at that point, <clears throat> after thinking about it for a minute, that he advised me to go and look for a man named Michel. Michel Nicoli could have been anywhere in the world. A former narcotics trafficker turned government informant, he had become a United States federally protected witness and had officially disappeared. I searched for him in Europe, North America, Central America, and South America. I uh, traveled many, many thousands of miles, spoke to hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, I was given a lot of false leads. Uh, I took out uh, coded ads in newspapers all over the world addressed to him uh, using language that he would understand. 
And finally, uh, in June of 1986, I almost by accident found the one person in the U.S. government who knew where he was, who was a very high official of the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration. I was able to persuade this man to put me in touch with him without telling him why I wanted to talk to Michelle, and he agreed to do so. Uh, my DEA contact at one point said to me that uh, in the 30 years that he had been in the business, Michelle was the best witness he'd ever had. He had never given the government false or misleading information. And if he said something was true, uh, as my friend said, you could go to the bank on it. Uh, another DEA official whom I spoke to in Marseille, who has known Michelle as a witness, said he's always been, in his words, a dynamite witness. Have you had any contact whatever with Christian David recently? No, I haven't. For how long? Not since, uh, since we were in Brazil together. I caught sight of him in prison, but uh, only in passing, that's all. We haven't been in touch. So that's how long it's been since you have had any contact with him. In 1972, we came back from Brazil together. I met him in prison. Or rather, I caught a glimpse of him in the criminal court, that's all. I just caught sight of him, that's all. Since then, I haven't seen him. In the course of three subsequent conversations, uh, among other things, uh, Michel confirmed that Lucien Sartie was one of the three killers. And I went through with him the details that uh, David had given me. Uh, he confirmed all of the details with the exception of two, in which case he said he did not know those specifics. But he did say that he had learned the details from the same source at the same time as David had. When we met in a bar in Argentina, in 1966, I think. Christian David was present. There were four, five, uh, five or six of us, I can't remember exactly. The final pieces of the puzzle were falling into place. From the lips of Michel Nicoli, Steve now had the names of the other two assassins. He now sought to confirm their participation from his first informant, still awaiting trial in his prison cell in Paris. At that point, I then went back to David. I gave him all three names, and in effect, he confirmed them. When I showed David an aerial photograph of Dealey Plaza, the first thing he said was, show me where the railroad bridge is. I pointed out the bridge over Elm Street, and he said that was where Sartie wanted to be. But on the morning of the assassination, the bridge was guarded, and he was forced, as he said, to move on to the little hill with the wooden fence. Uh, he took up a position from behind the wooden fence from which he fired one shot, and David specified that he used an explosive bullet. Now, he said that Sartie was the only one who used that kind of ammunition, a remark which he refused to explain and which I didn't understand at the time, until I put the question to Michel. When I asked Michel, if it were true that Sartie had used an exploding bullet, Michel sighed and said, yes, that was what I had heard. Yes, it's Lucien Sartie. Me too. I sometimes carried them with me, but I didn't use them. What was the advantage of having bullets like that? It makes a, it makes a larger hole in the body. And, uh, when the bullet flattens out, um, there aren't any traces, no marks, nothing. On the question of payment, uh, Michel agreed with David that the assassins had been paid in heroin, and he went a bit farther. Uh, in my first conversation with him, he indicated that although he did not know it at the time, it was he who converted the heroin payment into cash for the assassins. He indicated, in, at least initially, that the three men had appeared at his apartment in Buenos Aires uh, in the months following the assassination with, as he put it, a substantial quantity of heroin. He was surprised because, to his knowledge, it was the first time that any of the three of them had dealt in heroin. But given his reputation for not asking embarrassing questions, he simply agreed to convert the heroin into cash for them. Did uh, they ever give you any indication about who was behind this contract? 
No, they didn't talk to me about that. It was uh, Christian David who told me that it was someone in the mafia, but uh, I don't know who it was. But it was known more or less generally in this circle of Frenchmen in South America that it was the mafia that was behind it. Yes. My own conviction at this point is that the contract probably originated with Carlos Marcello of New Orleans, who placed it in Marseille through his colleague Santos Traficante Jr., who had the closest relations with Antoine Guérini. Beyond that, it seems reasonable that uh, Giancana of Chicago was involved, if uh, we accept David and Michelle's idea that uh, the assassins were met at the border by representatives of the Chicago Mafia. And the fact that uh, Sartis customers were primarily in New York and the fact that the assassins evidently moved out of the United States through the Montreal corridor, which was very closely linked to the New York Mafia, also suggests that Gambino may have been involved. In your view, why would they go so far to find assassins for such a job? Uh, in my opinion, to, um, to obliterate any traces, to fool, uh, to fool the government. Yes, it's more difficult to find foreign killers. It's more difficult, uh, in my view. The Mafia had to hire white men for the job since it was to take place in the American South, which meant that they could not go to the other two centers uh, where one found assassins at that time, namely Beirut and Hong Kong. Secondly, they needed highly experienced, uh, skilled assassins. Thirdly, they needed assassins who, if they were caught, could not directly be tied to the American Mafia, uh, and also who were not known to the American police. And fourthly, once again, if they were caught, assassins who could be counted on not to talk. When someone has a contract to kill someone, uh, he's not rubbing out the name, he's rubbing out the person. You just have to kill him, that's all. And according to who it is, you get paid more. According to who it is, and that's all. But after all, it was the President of the United States they were talking about. If, um, if they did it, uh, it's because um, uh, they didn't give a damn. There are people like David who refused to do it. There were others who didn't refuse. But Sarti, would he have been capable of that? Oh, yes. As a killer, he's capable of anything. It's not a question of sentiment. No sentiment with him. I couldn't pursue the matter much farther on my own. I mean, to this point, I had been working on it for three years, essentially, on my own. It was clear that at this point I was going to need some sort of official assistance. And so I decided to confide what I knew in the DEA official who had put me in touch with Michelle. Based upon what Michelle had said and his own inquiries, the DEA official decided that uh, the matter ought to be handled in an official fashion. The first step was uh, that he and I together went to interview Michelle. And to my enormous relief, Michelle repeated essentially the same story he had told me in front of the DEA official. At that point, I, in effect, had engaged some official interest uh, on the part of the government in my inquiries. The DEA official then felt that it was necessary to uh, make the FBI aware of what it was we had learned since the case was not in DEA's jurisdiction, but was still in the FBI's jurisdiction. The essence of what I learned was turned over to the FBI by the DEA in 1987. An official of the FBI then interviewed Michel Nicoli and indicated that he was persuaded by Nicoli's statement. I assumed at that point that given the testimony by credible witnesses, the government would then move toward the indictment and the arrest of the people who had been named. So far as I can tell, since then nothing has happened. Subsequent to that, I was able to learn from Christian David and other sources that the man who was in charge of the logistics and the organization of this plot was another Marseille gangster, a very important figure, was based here in Marseille for many years, named Paul Mondoloni, who was for many years the liaison between the Guérinis at their headquarters here on the Old Port and the U.S. Mafia, specifically Santos Traficante. 
they established that liaison in Havana when Mondaloni ran the Corsican casinos there, and it was sustained later when the Corsicans were thrown out by Castro and they were forced to move to Montreal uh, and establish a heroin uh, smuggling outpost there. Mondaloni would have been the ideal person to have, to have organized and, and uh, carried out this plot. Uh, the feeling on the part of the officials, both at DEA and FBI, however, was that before we could go to a grand jury, we would need two witnesses. We had potentially Michel Nicoli. They felt we would also have to have Christian David. However, Christian David has steadfastly refused to testify on this case until he is freed from jail. He obviously fears for his life. Now, all this is very frustrating. I mean, it's a very intolerable state of affairs because the men who murdered the President of the United States have been named by witnesses who even the government considers are credible. We, we have people we can put our hands on, people we can arrest, and nothing is being done about it. And yet until they're arrested and interrogated, and the truth comes from their own lips, if they are in fact guilty, we may never know the, the resolution of this mystery. Uh, we may never have the truth about, about this matter. And that's a situation that I personally find intolerable. Christian David is still in Paris on the old murder charge, the shooting of a French policeman in 1966. He vehemently protests his innocence. His defense lawyer, Henri Jeremy, has great faith in the credibility of his client and his extensive inside knowledge of the criminal underworld. David is not anybody. He's a serious man. And uh, American authorities know that David is a serious man. David has been a long time in jail during his life, but uh, anyway, he has made a lot of things during his life. Then when David says something, it's serious. But David has always been extremely reluctant to impart any details of what he knows about the killing of Kennedy, even to his own lawyer. He said, yes, I know certain things. Could you tell me those things? I asked him. He told me, no, I'll talk when I'll be free. Yes, but he told me, I can, if you want, write to you what I know. I said, all right. And then he wrote to me a letter, a closed letter and on this letter it's written cette lettre doit être gardée en dépôt par mon avocat jusqu'à ce que j'ai retrouvé ma liberté elle ne peut pas être ouverte sans mon autorisation that letter must be kept in deposit by my lawyer until i am free it's impossible to open it without my authorization. There is two signature, Christian David, Christian David. I think there is in this envelope details important to find murderers because I think there were murderers and on, not only one murderer that what it is in this envelope uh, that's what i think about that with the new evidence that has emerged from these investigations so many of the mysteries surrounding the murder of the president can at last be explained not least of all the manipulation of the medical evidence to conceal the devastating effects of the dum-dum bullet fired from the right front by Lucien Sarti. The use of such a distinctive missile and its trajectory would have been immediately apparent at a normal autopsy, as Dr. Cyril Wecht explains. A frangible bullet is one that is constructed to literally break apart upon impact. Some people uh, call it an exploding missile, some people uh, call it a dum-dum, but they're not quite the same. I think the more correct technical word would be a frangible bullet. If a frangible bullet had been fired from the right side, then it would have, of course, dispersed into dozens, if not hundreds, of fragments, leaving no significant 
piece of itself intact. There were many small pieces of metal that were never subjected to neutron activation analysis testing. And unless that was done, you see, we could never know for sure whether all of the fragments came from one particular bullet or one batch of bullets. That's the significance of the brain examination relating to whether there was a second gunman and also the possibility of whether a frangible bullet had been used by that second gunman firing from the right side. I've become convinced that Oswald had nothing to do with the assassination and that he was very carefully chosen and very carefully set up to take the blame. Uh, based upon what I've learned, it seems to me that all the principals involved in the plot to kill the president had ties of one kind or another with U.S. intelligence agencies. There was Traficante and Giancana, who had been conspiring with the CIA to assassinate Fidel Castro. Antoine Guérini, who had had a relationship with both the OSS and the CIA dating from 1943. And there was Oswald, whom, whom I'm satisfied uh, had been used as a low-level intelligence operative. So even though I don't think that the CIA, for example, had anything directly to do with the assassination, on the day after the assassination, they found themselves in a horribly compromised position a position in which they could very easily have been blackmailed by the plotters into covering up whatever they knew about the assassination. But the Mafia could hardly have acted alone, given the intricacy of the assassination plot and the strength of the cover-up for 25 years. Colonel Fletcher Prouty was Chief of Special Operations of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during Kennedy's presidency. He believes even more powerful forces were ultimately responsible. I think without any question, it's what we called the use of hired gunmen. And this isn't new. In fact, this little manual here, which is called the Assassination Manual for Latin America, contains a line which says that, talking about Latin America, if possible, professional criminals will be hired to carry out specific selective jobs. Jobs in quote, which means murders. Well, if this manual for Latin America, printed within the last few years, and a government manual, says that, there's no question but what the application of the same techniques was dated back in Kennedy's time. In fact, I know that from my own experience. You know, I was in that business in those days. So with that knowledge, you begin to realize that hired criminals, the way this book says, can be hired by anybody in power with sufficient money to pay them, but more importantly, with sufficient power to operate the cover-up ever after. Because you see, there's one thing to kill somebody. It's another thing to cover up the fact that you did it or that you hired somebody to do it. And that's more difficult. So they use the device of the Warren Commission report to cover up their hired killers. Now, who would hire the killers? And who has the power to put the Warren Commission report out over the top of the whole story? You see, you're dealing with a very high echelon of power. It doesn't necessarily reside in any government. It doesn't necessarily re reside in any single corporate institution, but it seems to reside in a blend of the two. Otherwise, how could you have gotten people like the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court to participate in the cover-up, the police in Dallas to participate in the cover-up, et cetera, and the media, you know, all the media, not just one or two newspapers, but none of them will print the story that other than Oswald killed the president with three bullets, something that's absolutely untrue. I think it's extremely important for the American people to know that there can be the overthrow of a government, that there can be a coup d'etat in America, that that in fact did happen through the assassination of President Kennedy. In order to prevent that kind of thing from happening again, in order to expose the forces that were responsible for that kind of murder and the kind of cover-up that has ensued in the following 25 years, it's necessary to expose it. Otherwise, we can have the same thing repeated again. Therefore, in the same fashion that we have exposed problems and scandals involved with Watergate, problems in Vietnam, problems in Central America, problems in the overthrow of governments elsewhere like Allende in Chile, and on and on and on, so must we expose that same kind of political assassination in our country. As painful as it may be, as uh, disruptive as it might be in a transitory nature, as embarrassing as it might be to certain individuals and organizations in the United States government, that has to be uncovered. If they were able to do it to John F. Kennedy then, they could do it to some other president in the future.